Amen. Folks, great to see you, those who are present here in person. Please be seated, those who are joining us online. May the Lord truly bless you. I had to pull a bit of an audible. I brought a sweatshirt this morning that my wife uh, and my little foster daughter picked up for me for Father's Day. And it says dad across it. It's pretty cool. But this sanctuary, for those who don't know, it's about 85 degrees in here. I didn't put the ACs on early enough. So I had to kind of change into something else. So if this shirt looks familiar, it should. I wore it last week. I had it in my office. Don't judge me. People re-wear clothes. But maybe I'll bust out the Father's Day outfit uh, in the weeks ahead. Well, it's good to see you. Welcome to those, who are, to, our, to those of you who are here as well. Uh, this morning, I want to offer a very basic message. There's going to be, in a sense, no new revelation or complexity. I want to just spend some time considering what Scripture says to those of us who are dads. Um, you know, the Bible amazingly has a lot to say on every topic we can imagine, in a sense. So when we talk about Mother's Day a few months ago or a few weeks back, really, the word has a lot to say to moms and to the women who play those roles. It has a lot to say to those of you who are little ones, to those who are kids, whether they're here or at home. Scripture has quite a bit to say to you, but this morning I want to speak to the dads. And I want to wrestle with the question, really, what does Scripture say concerning those of us who were dads. Again, that's biologically, adoptively, foster and beyond. So if you are a father in the sound of my voice, I'm talking to you in a sense, and I want you to consider the call that God has for you. It is lofty, but the one who calls you is faithful, and I call you to trust him to empower you to make you into the person he has called you to be. To the wives in the sound of my voice, please don't tune out. Because consider what the word of God has to say to you regarding the man that you have pledged to love. May you come to appreciate them all the more and pray for them all the more, knowing the part that they play in the home is invaluable, God-ordained, and sacred. And finally, to the kids, in the sound of my voice, boys and girls alike, consider what scripture has to say regarding your dads. And may this teaching inform those of you who were young boys that you might know the kind of man to grow up to be so that one day as you lead your own family and home in Christ, you'll know what the word has to say to you. And to all the young ladies in the sound of my voice, here or at home, uh, may you have wisdom when it comes time to choose your mate in the future, to know what kind of a mate to look for. Don't settle. Can I get an amen to any of those points? All kinds of people at home, I'm sure, are saying amen. Well, the word has a lot to say. I want to give you really just an array of points this morning, each very quick. I'm going to, going to go in kind of bullet-like fashion or bullet point fashion. Number one, the word of God calls fathers. I'm going to say first and foremost, to provide instruction and training for godly life and living. It was difficult for me to narrow down which verse to use or which verses because it's such an oft-visited topic. Scripture calls men, fathers, to instruct and to train. Start your children off, it says, in the way that they should go. And even when they are old, they will not turn from it. I love what it says in Ephesians 6. Fathers, don't exasperate your children. We'll talk about that one a little bit later on. Instead, bring them up in the training and in the instruction of the Lord. Don't answer out loud, but I want you to think about this. Whose job is it to ensure that your child is pointed to the Lord? Is it the pastor's job? Secondarily, perhaps. Is it the children's church workers and youth group workers? To a degree. But you want to know who has the most impact to train your child and to point them to Jesus? It's the parents. And with it being Father's Day, I want to point out your role in that data. Failure to instruct and or invest in your little ones may yield catastrophic result. I found this story interesting. A young man was sentenced to be, to, a young man was to be sentenced to the penitentiary. Now the judge had known him from childhood for he was well acquainted with his father, who was a famous legal scholar and the author of an exhaustive study entitled The Law of Trusts. So the magistrate asked this boy, do you remember your father? I remember him well, your honor, came the reply. Then trying to probe the offender's conscience, the judge said, as you were about to be sentenced, and as you think of your wonderful dad, what do you remember most clearly about him? There was a pause. Then the judge received an answer he did not expect. I remember when I went to him for advice. 
He looked up at, up at me from the book that he was writing and said, run along, boy, I'm busy. And I, when I went to him later for companionship, he turned away saying, run along, son, this book that I'm writing must be finished. Your Honor, you remember him as a great lawyer. I remember him as a lost friend. And the judge said to himself, alas, the man finished the book, but he lost the boy. You tell me at the end of your life what's more important than raising your child to know the Lord, both in this life and the life to come. Point number two, scripture calls fathers to provide a godly example of consistent character and morality. It's not enough for us as men to just simply give words in lip service to what scripture says, but we have to live this thing out. Now, the key word there in this regarding example is consistent character and morality. No one gets this right all the time. So gentlemen, please don't hear this and say, I failed, I must therefore be a failure and of no use to my kid. That's not really the truth. Because you can show your kid, even in your failures, what it means to run to the Lord for his grace and for his mercy. But we are to be a people who takes the following seriously. Do not merely listen to the word, it says, in the book of James, and so deceive yourselves. You ready for the wisdom here? Do what it says. Don't just tell your kids, show your kids. I want to read the text to you out of 2 Timothy chapter 3. Again, you can turn to these as you desire. I have so many Bible verses this morning, but this one's a good one. The Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy is writing to his spiritual son in the faith. And even though Paul was not the biological father of Timothy, he, he kind of adopted that role, in a sense, of investing into this young man who would really carry on the work of the ministry after Paul was gone. And this is what he says to Timothy in his final letter that we have on record. You, Timothy, you know all about my teaching and my way of life my purpose, my faith and patience and love and endurance. You know about my persecutions and my sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me at different places that he mentions like Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. The persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. I love that the Apostle Paul didn't just tell Timothy a bunch of things to do, but he says to Timothy, you've had time, not just to hear me teach and preach, but you've had the time to watch the kind of life that I've lived. Do what I said to do, but in some ways, more importantly, live the way that you saw me live. Because Paul knew that his days were short. He knew his death was about to come. So in one final moment, he's writing to his spiritual son in the faith, saying, you've seen me, you've watched me, copy me. And based upon another text that he wrote, follow me as I follow Christ. There's something profound about being able to tell your little ones, follow me as I follow Christ. I'm not showing you how to do it perfectly, but I'm showing you how to do it consistently enough that you get a picture of what this thing should look like. I found a quote that I came across that was rather interesting. It was written by an educator who was a Catholic priest. And he says that we are, find, we are finding that both men and women get their basic religious style from the example of their fathers. And this is what the, what the priest concludes. A failure in one generation starts a cycle that echoes down through the ages to come. What kind of legacy are we leaving behind? When the day comes for you to be gone and you depart, will your son or daughter know what it means to serve the Lord? Because they can always remember back to the example that you set. Something profound in that question. It's not an easy question to wrestle with because we do fail. And praise God, he's merciful and gracious. And I fall in a good way upon that grace. But the same grace that brings pardon also brings empowerment so that I can rise up and become more as he empowers me. Point number four, I'm going to skip a few points. I have too many. I want to hit certain ones. The word of God calls fathers to discipline their children. Everybody say discipline. We live in a generation that does not love this term. But is it possible to be a disciple of Christ without discipline? You notice how those two words go together. Now I'm going to read a text. Don't misconstrue it. Whoever spares the rod hates their children. 
That is not tacit permission to go and beat your kids. Please don't say, Pastor James told me to use a rod on my kid. No. But there is a place for biblical discipline. And the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. I don't have the time to fully explore it this morning, but I want you to consider in your own time the figure of Eli from the book of 1 Samuel. If you don't spend a lot of time in the Old Testament, please do. There are so many wonderful accounts in the Old Testament text. And the figure of Eli, to me, is an interesting one. Very quickly, Eli was a Jewish priest living in the days of the judges. And he's best remembered in some ways for, ble- for the, sa- the blessing that he offered to Samuel's mother, Hannah, and for his part in Samuel's first prophecy. Samuel is a significant figure in the Old Testament text. But he had two wicked sons who were named Hophni and Phinehas. Ever, ever meet a person named Hophni or Phinehas? Isn't it funny we don't, we don't carry on these names because they're villainous figures? Now, these men, like their father, also served in the tabernacle, but they did not know the Lord. They violated the Lord in his law in many ways, including but not limited to keeping and eating meat from sacrifices that was not supposed to go to them. They also uh, had sex with the women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting, according to the book of 1 Samuel chapters 1 and 2. Now, the bad behavior of Eli's son, Hekel and Jekyll, Hophni and Phinehas, was widely known. The community knew that these two were scoundrels, and so did Eli himself. But according to scripture, Eli was judged by God because he failed to constrain and properly discipline his sons, allowing them to continue to profane the tabernacle of the Lord. Now, how many of you want God to speak to you and have prophetic words for your life? I do. Does anybody want this word, though? The Lord said to Samuel, who was just a boy, See, I'm about to do something in Israel that's going to make the ears of everyone who hears them tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin that he knew about. His sons blasphemed God and he failed to restrain them. Now, this is the Lord speaking through Samuel. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli... The guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Think about that. What was the great failing of Eli? It was the failure to discipline his kids and to to shut them off from doing things that they should not have done. They should have been removed from their post and exposed for what they were. But he allowed it to continue because he loved his kids. Notice the air quotes there. Didn't want to step on their toes maybe didn't want to embarrass them or embarrass his namesake. But in the end, his namesake is now one of disgrace. In a generation of people that are hesitant to discipline their kids, get on it, because all you're going to do is create monsters. And I wonder how much of what we're seeing in our culture now is a a failure for fathers to be present in the home and engaged in the discipline thereof. Those are good points. You can say amen to any of those. Point number, point number five or four, depending on how you're counting. This is kind of the counterpa- counterpoint to it or, or balance. The word of God does call fathers to discipline their kids, but also to, to, cultiv- to raise them in a spirit or an attitude of gracious encouragement. Keep this in mind. Fathers, it says in Ephesians 6, don't exasperate your children. It says in Colossians 3, fathers, do not embitter your children. Let me explain what I mean by this or what the word means by this. We must set standards for our kids and we have to discipline them accordingly. But we also have to be reasonable. We can't set standards that are unrealistic or unattainable or too lofty. We should be the first to praise their successes and also the first to offer them comfort when they fail. Otherwise, frustration and resentment will set in. Listen to the story that I found. Many of you are baseball fans, but there's apparently a figure named Keith Hernandez. I don't know who he is, but I trust that you do. Keith Hernandez is one of baseball's top players, or he was. He is a lifetime 300 hitter who has won numerous Golden Glove awards for excellence in fielding. He's won a batting championship for having the highest average, the most valuable player award in his league, and even the World Series. 
Yet with all of his accomplishments, he has missed out on something crucially important to him. His father's acceptance and recognition that what he has accomplished is of value. Now there was an interview where, I'll, I'll read this to you, listen to what he said in a very candid interview about his relationship with his father. One day, Keith, Keith asked his father, Dad, I have a lifetime 300 batting average. What more do you want? His father replied, but well, one day you're going to look back and say to yourself, I could have done more. Imagine how that deflated the son who tried so hard to excel, and in the end, he didn't get an attaboy, even though the crowds loved him. All he got from his father was, you could have done better. That's exasperating your children. Don't be that kind of a parent. Have standards. But in the name of Jesus, have some grace and mercy too, and encourage them when they fail. I promise you that will inspire them to do all the better over the course of life and living. Point, next point, I'm going off numbers here, so I'm going to stop saying point four, five, or six. The Word of God calls fathers to invest quality time into their kids. When I was in Bible school, our president had a very famous and oft-repeated line that love is spelled T-I-M-E. Time has become in our culture a precious commodity. Everybody these days is so busy. And for many men, time is the hardest thing to give their kids. But there's a reality that there is some connection that has to take place over the course of the days, weeks, and months where you have to spend time with them. It says in Scripture, Deuteronomy 6, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Now here's the part that I want to focus on. Talk about them when you sit at home. And when you walk along the road. And when you lie down and when you get up. In other words, the word of God and the instruction thereof and this quality time should be an ongoing thing. It shouldn't just be a moment here and there, but there should be an ongoing connection. What happens if we, if we fail to spend time with our kids? I want to read a few things to you. Studies show that the absence of a father expresses itself in male children in two very different ways. It's linked to increased aggressiveness on one hand or a greater manifestation of effeminacy on the other. Now, there was a study back in 1987, way back, but it's still a study was done. A study of violent rapists found that 60% of them came from single-parent homes. A Michigan State University study of adolescents who committed homicides found that 75% of them were from broken homes. Girls without fathers fare no better. They become sexually active sooner and are far more likely to have out-of-wedlock children. That's all kind of a bummer. I'm not saying that to say that if you're a single mom or if you come from a broken home, you're automatically doomed to these things. What I am saying is that as the church of Jesus Christ, we have to realize God has given a design for the family. And when we violate that design, we don't get the results that we like or that we even anticipate or want. If we want to see a change in America, and I think that we all do, what do you think the best place for that to start is? Let me tell you, it's in the home. It's a mother and a father spending time with their kids, quality time, and from time to time opening up the word and discussing it and letting it become a part of that kid's spiritual DNA. James Dobson, many of you know him, he talks about finding the balance between the workplace and, and the home. And many, many dads have really a guilt trip over the fact that they never feel like they have enough time to invest in their kids. He gives a series of thoughts, I'll give you just a handful, just some practical things that you can do. Have a dinner time. Gather around the family table. How many were raised with dinner around a family table? Put all the hands down. Don't raise it to the next question, but how many still do it? <laughs> the hands went up anyway. In many homes, dinner time has become a time for people to retire to different rooms, to watch television and beyond. Why don't have a dinner time? 
Spend time around the table talking. Set some time aside after dinner, he says, to maybe talk about things or do some homework. Listen. Listen to their stories at mealtime. Talk with them over some chores. Do some bedtime prayers. Create family rituals. He talks about sa Saturday morning pancakes and Sunday night pizza and Monday night walks or beyond. There are things that we can do that include our kids. And while we include our kids and they're by our side, they're watching and they're learning and you can have these quality discussions. I look back over my life. My father has been gone now for about two years, Lord rest his soul. All the memories that jump off the page to me, they're not the big vacations. We went to Disney a lot, but when I think of my father, the first thing I think of is not Disney World, though I love Disney to this day because of him. It was just being in the yard with him, or playing catch, or just taking a ride with him and just asking him questions. There were no car seats or seat belts back then, so I'd literally be standing next to my father while he was driving. Somehow we all survived that generation. But it's the daily little things, these little moments that over the course of time made a cumulative impact on the person that I'm called to be. It's important, spend time with your kids. Little time, here and there, make the time, make it a priority. Almost done. The word of God calls fathers to forgive when necessary. We are to be models of mercy and grace. Let's go to the book of Luke chapter 15. I do want you to see this one. There's a place for forgiveness. There's a place for pardon. There's a place for grace and mercy. Those things are important. Because I promise you at some point your kid's going to hurt your feelings and wound you. And you've got to forgive. Luke 15. This is a very famous account. We're not going to linger long, but I want you to see a few things. Luke 15, starting at verse 11, Jesus is teaching. And he, he, he gives a parable here. A short story that's meant to illustrate deep spiritual truths. There was a man who had two sons. And the younger one said to his father, Father... Give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them. Now I want to stop there because we can read that and not feel the emotion of it. Luke 15 verse 12. Because what he's telling the father, who's still very much alive, Dad, to me you're in a sense already dead. Just give me what's coming to me. Why make me wait the 10, 15, 20, or 30 years? How many of you would be incredibly hurt if your kid came to you and said, why don't you just give me what's in the will now? Why do I have to wait? What a cruel son. What a villainous kid. And anyone who heard this teaching from the mouth of Jesus would have instantly despised and scorned this son. But the father doesn't. Now, not long after, verse 13, the younger son got together all that he had and he set off for a distant country where the grass was always greener. But there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the field to feed pigs. Now, if you were a person in this culture who was Jewish, it doesn't get any worse than this because pigs were, they were forbidden. You don't touch them, you don't eat them. But he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. You know, it's a really bad day when you're looking at what a pig is eating and say, that looks really good. That's where this kid is. Now, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, but I'm starving to death. Now, he comes to his senses and he says the following. I'm going to set out and I'm going to go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. This is called humility, by the way. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. Now this is the part that I want to emphasize. While he was still a long way off, the father saw him and he was filled with what? Say it out loud. Compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Notice that that came before the apology. 
It does not say that the son went and apologized and then the father, in a sense, showed mercy and grace. Once he saw his son who was in the distance, he made a beeline to that kid and fell on him. And I can just imagine the joy in the heart of that father. Now the son does go through with the confession, Father, I've sinned against you in heaven. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but the father was too busy saying, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger, put sandals on his feet, bring the fattened calf, kill it. We're going to have a feast and celebrate. Finally, why? Verse 24, for this son of mine was dead. But now he's alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. This father models so many things for me who's a picture, by the way, of our Heavenly Father. But there's, what a wonderful model of grace. What a wonderful model of mercy. What did this kid really deserve for all that he had done? It wasn't the fattened calf and a ring on his finger and the best of robes in a party. He should have been allowed to die in that foreign country and starve to death. But mercy said otherwise. Mercy chose to withhold that judgment, and grace chose to extend to him the benefits of being a child, of a son, or a daughter, depending on your gender. Dads, can we not show this kind of an example? How are your little ones ever going to learn to go on and live a life of forgiveness if you don't model that for them when they're young? Let them see it. Let your home just permeate with mercy and grace and pardon. Be kind, it says, and compassionate to one another. Forgive each other, just as Christ and God, Christ God forgave you. In Christ, God forgave you. Final point, it's a very short one that we're going to close. The word of God calls fathers, final point for the morning, to love their wives. Hear me in this. The word of God calls fathers to love their wives. Men of God, the best thing that you can do for your kids and for your family is to be a good husband and to love your wife. A loving connection between husband and wife is the foundation for the whole of the home. There will be no, there can be no overall health if the foundation is cracked and if it's faulty. So you can desire to be the best father, and that's noble. But don't get so lost in that pursuit that you forget the woman who's by your side. Who, who is directly responsible for the making of those kids. If you want to set them on a trajectory that leads to long-term health in this life and beyond, show them what it means to be a good husband. Love your wives. Consider the instruction of the Apostle Paul. Husbands, love your wives. Before he even begins to talk about how fathers should treat their kids in the book of Ephesians or how kids should treat their fathers, he opens with this. This is the foundation. Husbands, love your wives. In one of the hardest verses to live up to, but in a sense it's so inspiring at the same time. Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I don't have time to unpack this, but how did Jesus love the church? What are the words that we would use to describe the kind of love that he has for his people? That's the kind of love that we are to practice unto our wives. Now, wives, you have your own set of responsibilities toward your husband and toward your, toward your kids that Scripture talks about. But as far as Father's Day, men of God, love your wives. Treat them well. Reflect Jesus to them. Your kids are going to pick up on that. And one day when they're older, and it'll be here before you know it, this is a church full of young kids and young families it's not going to be long before they start to marry off. That 10, 20 years is going to fly right by. And they're going to know what it means to have a healthy marriage, which is a life-giving and wonderful thing, by watching yours. And as I close, if your marriage isn't in the best place, you ready for this? Work on it. If you need professional help, get it. Invite people in to solve the problems. Be a student of the word. Put into practice what you read. There's no reason in heaven or on earth to have a failing or a flailing marriage. This can be fixed. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. 
so much more. If you want to download the notes, feel free to do so. They're going to be posted in the days ahead on the church website. I want to say thank you for tuning in. To all of the fathers who are here and at home, may the Lord truly in every way bless you. We say thank you for the role that you play. It is invaluable. It is precious. It is God-ordained, and it is sacred. And I charge you, and I charge myself, let's play that role well. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you on this Father's Day. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Uh, for those who are present, you can feel free to give in the offering boxes that are located in the back of the sanctuary. For those who are online, newlifeberry.org, should you desire to give, uh, feel free to do so there. Hope to see you in the days ahead. As weeks go on, more and more folks are coming on out, so feel free to look at the policies and protocols online on the website and on this Facebook page. We'd love to see you in person. Until then, we'll see you soon. God bless and happy Father's Day.